The Libertarian State Leadership Alliance presents our 2017 National Conference, The Future of the Libertarian Political Movement. In collaboration with Outright Libertarians, we present Using Fully Informed Juries to Protect Minority Rights, a panel with Leslie Peterson, Mike Shipley, and Siobhan Lynch. My name is Leslie Peterson. I'm the Outreach Director for Outright Libertarians. We are the Gender and Sexual Minority Caucus of the Libertarian Party. We focus on education and outreach and activism. Um, why are you running away? Okay. Well, uh, it, it, it's a little, uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Mike and let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mike Shipley. Um, I'm actually the chair of the organization. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I introduced myself earlier. Um, we developed this talk in um, coordination with a fully informed jury association. Um, everybody thinks that jury nullification, we know everything about it. So yeah, because I mean, what is there to know? You get on a jury, you vote no, right? Um, well, guess what? There is more to know about it. Um, so kind of maybe just put down what you think that you know and come with an open mind because um, we're going to teach you some more stuff. I'm Siobhan Lynch. Uh, also, I prefer Trish uh, in personal um, interactions. So, uh, people, you'll hear people refer to me as Trish. Um, I am uh, recently uh, with these guys, um, and uh, I uh, I don't know. I, I do a lot of things, but uh, you know, I'm here to speak for outright today. So. So, just a little bit of background about the two organizations that came together to create this talk. Um, Outright Libertarians was formed in 1998 by, by a group of LGBT libertarians with the purpose to advance the message of individual liberty and how it correlates with gay rights issues and GSM issues within the United States. We're with the Libertarian Party, registered as 501c4, so don't get us confused with anything else. Um, and we have executive elected officers, of which Mike is one, um, the Fully Informed Jury Association um, works to, I have a little blurb here, inform potential jurors of their traditional legal authority to refuse to, to, refuse to enforce unjust laws, inform potential jurors they cannot be required to check their consciences at the courthouse door, inform potential jurors that they cannot be punished for their verdicts, and inform everyone that juror veto Jury nullification is a peaceful way to protect human rights against corrupt politicians and government tyranny. So we're going to do a little bit of background in, about jury nullification. So what is jury nullification? I'm going to pass that to Mike here. Hi. So um, I don't know Leslie's talk because a lot of the last time we did this, it was a, a small discussion format. I'll just say it in my own words. So basically, jury nullification is this idea that a citizen juror, basically the juror is kind of like the final check and balance on the, uh, the government's power. So what's going on is that the state is approaching the people and asking for final permission to actually execute this sentence on the accused, right? So it's that, that, um, that concept of the jury of the peers is that, that final moment where um, the state is about to, you know, exact retribu retribution upon the accused, right? And they can't do that without checking with the jury. It's like a really important thing. It's been around since common law that um, the jury members are not bound by um, the instructions of the, the king or the legislature or whoever it is. Um, they can vote their conscience and they can vote their conscience for any reason whatsoever, right? So you'll hear this, oh, you, if the letter of the law finds then you must find guilty, that's bullshit. You can find innocent, not guilty, whatever you want, for any reason. If you think the law is unjust, not guilty. So jury nullification is a really empowering sort of, it's almost like an anarchist-ish thing. Um, to get on a jury and you can save somebody's life. So, how did I do? You're good. Um, so in civil trial, a jury null nullification, a jury can nullify by finding a defendant not liable. In... I'm sorry, oh, I had a PowerPoint, but my computer just wasn't doing it. 
Um, and even though the members of the jury may believe that the defendant did an illegal act, they do not believe he or she should be punished for it. This is really important. We see jury nullification happening a lot in the liberty movement when it comes to the drug war. So if you talk to a jury nullification advocate, um, the first thing they're going to say, we can use this pro pot, we can use this against the drug war, we can use this in this case. We very rarely see them break out of that paradigm of using it only for the drug war. Um, what we're doing here is we're going to introduce it in using it against unjust GSM laws. Um, what happens is we, we have jury nullification of unjust laws. Um, it doesn't set a precedent in the court, but it does set a pattern for lawmakers to look at. And if we have enough of these unjust laws that become nullified in the court, it can give evidence and support to get rid of these laws. Um, yeah, we're going on to the historical use of jury nullification. Um, jury nullification in the United States first appeared just before the American Revolutionary War, when colonial juries frequently exercised their nullification power, pr principally in maritime, maritime cases and cases implicating free speech. In the pre-Civil War era, juries sometimes refused to convict for violations of the Fugitive Slave Act. Later during Prohibition, juries often nullified alcohol control laws, possibly as often as 60% of the time. We are nowhere near that in our current Prohibition state. Nowhere near that, but we need to be. Um, this resistance may have contributed to the adoption of the 21st Amendment, repealing prohibition, the 18th Amendment. While defendants accused of crimes against blacks and other minorities have been acquitted by all white juries in the South, which is a frequent um, talking point against jury nullification, even in the face of irrefutable evidence, we also have evidence of juries releasing blacks and other racial minorities from victimless crimes in court. Um, in the 21st century, many discussions of jury nullification center on drug wars, which I talked on, that some consider unjust in either principle or because they seem to discriminate against certain groups. Um, we all know how the drug war as it currently is disproportionately affects blacks and other minor racial minorities in the US. There's some issues that when we bring up jury nullification, um, judges and other court officials will bring up with us. Um, there are several issues raised, um, such as whether juries can or should be instructed or informed of their power to nullify, that a judge may remove jurors for cause when they refuse to apply the law as instructed, a judge may punish a juror for exercising prior jury nullification, and all legal arguments except perhaps on motions. Okay. Um, now, when we created this talk with Fija, we used a piece of research done by Adrian Levet with the Seattle Journal for Social Justice, and I know we hate that term in the Libertarian Party, don't we? <laughs> but it came out in April of 2002, and it's called Jur Queering Jury Nullification, Using Jury Nullification as a Tool to Fight Against the Criminalization of Queer and Transgender People. And we're going to move on to talking about, and this comes down to the discussion section of how this research applies. Okay, well, just I just wanted to piggyback off a little bit more information about that, um, that paper. Um, and the idea, so justice is a good thing, right? So adding an adjective to the word justice doesn't mean that we have to like panic and run out the door. So fiscal justice, social justice, political justice, those are good things. Economic justice. Um, so, I, <laughs> thank you for warning everybody not to panic. Um, a lot of our advocacy does live in what is considered a social justice camp, but we observe the non-aggression principle, so no one has to like, you know, be afraid that we're gonna hurry up and like establish a communism <laughs> up here. No, but I wanted to tell you about the paper is based on another paper, and here's where it gets into a political strategic space, kind of piggybacking on something that we talked about earlier, um, and because the paper was based on another uh, paper that was 
um, towards communities of color, especially African Americans. And I feel like there's a huge um, area where we can take these ideas and speak to people who have been activated by, um, for instance, Black Lives Matter, and, um, ideas about the police state and police um, brutality, and which again overlaps into you know like the drug war and stuff. So there's like a really rich um, space here that we can really build out into um, social justice communities. Now, what was I supposed to actually say? <laughs> Oh, okay, here's what, so, um, because um, for just a long time, there has been kind of this paradigm where, oh, if I say a, a plural adjective or a plural noun, gays, I've suddenly done collectivism, so I have to like run screening for the door because communism, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we haven't really, um, there's a lot of, and so, the, the, in doing so, we've left that narrative up to the mainstream left, right? Well, the mainstream left is all about, you know, big state policies, right? So they don't actually have a whole lot to offer oppressed, marginalized um, communities. So they were able to do things like same-sex marriage, right? Because that's a conservative institution and they're really like just Republicans painted blue anyway. Um, because that involves the state, right? Um, but they can't really touch things like sex work because that involves dismantling the state. They can't really touch things like criminalizing of BDSM identities because that involves dismantling the state. They can't really touch on the way that um, people who are fleeing persecution in places like um, Russia, Uganda, um, you know, without dismantling the, um, what do you call that? The, 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 the deportation. There's a word for that. You know, the, the like industrial complex where they... Deportation industrial complex? Yeah, there is another word for it, but I forgot. Immigration control? Or... Yeah, yeah, something like that. Immigration control, yeah. No, there's a really sinister no, sounding name for it. I can't come up with it right now. But... There's always but sinister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we have the answer to dispatching you, right? But they don't, right? They can't really... Just they really can't, you know, touch any of that, but we can. Um, and all of these are... Um, issues that are brought before a jury in a criminal um, setting. Yeah. No, and then we're going to talk about while walking while queer. Can I start this one? So, who in the audience has heard the phrase "walking while black"? Yeah. So frequently we see the police and other law enforcement officers who disproportionately target black Americans and other racial minorities during their day-to-day -day lives. Um, we have people arrested and killed over selling individual cigarettes on the street. We have people who are stopped and shot for driving their cars, um, stopping at stoplights, um, having a brake light out. We have all of this. Um, and these have been in the news frequently, um, a lot recently. It's become a topic. But what we don't talk about as much is these types of things happen to the GSM community as well. We experience in the GSM community, of which I'm a part, and the other members of this panel are, a much higher stopping, arrest, sentencing, and conviction rates than the mainstream general population. Um, some examples are sex work. Um, Sex workers are criminalized for their profession. Um, they get arrested in our vain attempt to stop, quote, human trafficking. Um, this is not to say that some human trafficking doesn't exist. I mean, it definitely does. But um, there are very real and innocent victims of this. Um, other examples are BDSM clubs and swingers clubs that are forced out of towns and shut down and fined and the owners arrested for doing what they do, for There's choosing... In Massachusetts in 2001, uh, a guy... There was one in Massachusetts in 2001. Uh, some people uh, who are from this general area down to you know, Rhode Island have probably heard of it. It was called Paddleboro. Um, two people uh, had uh, run a 
BDSM party out of a rented house. Um, the police came and raided, arrested pretty much everybody inside uh, for running what they called a house of ill repute. Um, ultimately, uh, if I remember right, the charges were dropped, but it was after about two years and they pretty much bankrupted uh, the people involved uh, with legal fees and everything else. Uh, and our community was constantly pouring money into their defense. Um, and most of these, a lot of these people are not people who can really afford to even pour money into that. Um, so it really does affect our communities. Um, and there was a large amount of, uh, you know, uh, pretty much a wide range of sexualities and gender identities within that particular group. Um. Another aspect that I want to touch on is GSM populations, because of the societal and cultural norms that Americans have, um, are at a disproportionately high rate for mental illness and homelessness, domestic violence, drug use and abuse. All of these things are in some way criminalized by the state. Um, being homeless is a criminal crime. Uh, you may not think it, but you try being homeless and finding a place to sleep at night, and you'll find a place in jail. Um, I know we have some personal stories in this room about how these things have been criminalized and fought by the state. But these things are victimless <laughs> crimes. Um, homelessness, drug use, abuse, mental illness, um, the only way we're going to fight these, we're never going to convince the state to change it. Um, I would love to think so, but <laughs> I see Frank's a little skeptical here. Um, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. Scroll up. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm sorry, I, that was really rude. Um, <laughs> but so what's going on, because when um, Kirsten and I developed the talk, um, Leslie wasn't present. No, so. I had to come up with my own PowerPoint. And what I was gonna kind of like prompt you to notice yeah. is that <laughs> um, it's a series of discussion questions about the, um, the way that GSM people become ensnared in the system. Um, and I think what was happening right now is a perfect segue into that. Because for instance, um, GSM youth who are raised in religious um, conservative households, um, is a, that's a really common um, entry point into homelessness um, and things like survival sex. So what we find like from the very um, beginning of our experience growing up in a, a, an environment that, um, growing up in a society that teaches us that we don't deserve to walk the planet, that our very existence is, uh, you know, like that I'm a big ball of filth that like you should, you know what I mean? Um, that, you know, God created just to burn you and like families are all, you know, panicked over it. And, you know, when we internalize these things, um, we start to, you know, well, you know, if they kick us out, we go straight to homelessness, right? Um, and either way, you know, we might start using um, drugs or alcohol or sex, right, to fill up that space where, um, you know, self self respect goes. Um, so I'm going to turn back the mic that I so rudely grabbed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to go on. Um, the way we counter this, and we set the precedent like we did back in Prohibition. We fight in the juries. We nullify every case that we find of GSM populations discriminated against and targeted by the criminal justice system. We keep these arrests down, we keep the sentencing and convictions down, and if we set enough of a precedence, eventually the laws will change. Or, that's the hope. Um, we saw it happen in Prohibition, we can see it happen again. Um, hmm? In Prohibition. Prohibition. We can see it happen again with the drug war and with prohibiting people's uh, gender and sexual identities. Um, I'm going to open this up for discussion with the other panelists and then questions from you all. Well, I'm 
I'm trying to find the other thing, so. Okay, so basically the, um, the narrative here is that there are a series of encounters that we have with the enforcement system as we find ourselves drawn into um, you know, the GSM experience, right? So it might start in my youth by um, being asked to leave my home and finding myself, you know, a young twink who, which I wasn't a twink because I have body hair and twinks don't, right? But, um, <laughs> right, they're very popular with elderly gentlemen who have money to spend, right? So um, there, you, there goes your survival sex. I mean, and we saw the, we recently saw a case with a young male in, somewhere in the Midwest, who was having a consensual relationship, relationship with a Republican congressman in his area and he was criminalized for taking basically sugar baby money from his partner every time he met up. Um, that was consensual. He was of the age of consent. Um, they're con criminalizing the act. Um, that would have been a perfect opportunity for somebody to stealth onto the jury and nullify that case. I like stealthing. So, there's the survival sex, right? And then there's the drug use and there's the homeless, right? So that's layer one. So I've been living in this systemic environment that you know drove me out. And now I'm at already a disproportionate rate of behaviors that are exposing me to the enforcement power. So the next layer is how do disproportionate, um, how does policing disparities draw me again into another layer of being disproportionately, right? So this is where I'm being visually profiled. This is where I'm being, well, not me, but walking while trans. I guess I would be walking while gay, right? Walking while queer, yeah. Walking while queer, right? Or this is where um, I'm in an adult bookstore and the police raid the thing, right? Um, because I'm trying to find my next sugar daddy or whatever. Um, or I'm just high out of my mind. <laughs> like, you know, where do you go at that point, right? Um, so the police are out there and they're instructed to identify people um, and behaviors that, um, you know, that they can observe visually, right? So um, there was a case in Phoenix where um, Monica Jones, and some of you may have heard of this story, Monica Jones was walking down the street, and she's a big, beautiful trans woman, and she actually is a sex worker, but she wasn't working that night, and Phoenix has this thing called manifestation. Um, so it basically it means if you look like a hooker, the cops can stop you, and that's a crime. So walking down the street looking like a hooker is a crime. <laughs> I mean, and who has it? <laughs> right, but so Monica Jones was out there, and, and she, um, they picked her up, and they flipped a Yui, and he, you know, and trapped her, um, and so they popped her for management station and actually not completing the transaction, but verbally, like almost, I guess. Um, that was actually struck down in court because the ACLU got involved and they challenged it on free speech grounds, or yeah, yeah. something like that. Right? Yeah, I'm allowed to look like a hooker if I want. Um, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the policing disparities. Disparities, and another example of that would be um, when I'm homeless and I'm sleeping in a park. Then I'm suddenly um, exposed as well. So that's the next layer. So the enforcement. So you can see there's already been two layers, and we're not even done. We have like three or four more layers that we get through. So I'll let um, Leslie explain the next one. This is your thing. <laughs> so, okay, so here we are, and I'm going to tell a little story here, uh, just visualize it. Um, I am walking while trans. Um, I'm flagged for whatever reason as a target by law enforcement. Uh, I'm picked up, I'm brought into essentially holding. Um, and I'm only talking uh, from a New York City perspective here because that's where my experience is. 
Um, and this hasn't happened to me, but I've worked with a lot of people who it has. Um, and essentially, you're brought into holding, and especially with trans people, um, the first thing that happens <laughs> is, is that they can't figure out where to put you, and neither one is particularly safe at that point. Um, so the, the justice system, and especially the, the, the enforcement side, is not prepared uh, to deal with people of, uh, you know, uh, queer identities, uh, especially gender minorities. Um, and from that point, you know, you're, you're essentially uh, waited to be seen on arraignment. Um, then you have to deal with bail. Well, bail gets set much higher. Um, and if you're lucky to have been flagged as a sex worker, and I know this sounds strange, uh, in New York there are uh, sort of preventative ways of, of moving people. Swap does a lot of stuff. Um, I wouldn't say they're particularly effective, but uh, it's ways of getting... What What's that? You didn't see what happened last week. Yeah, well... Um, but essentially, they, they sometimes they're able to either lower the bail or get you released on pretrial, but if they can't, then essentially you're held until trial, and that could be a couple years. Um, and they pretty much screw you if you are of a gender minority. Um, from that point, then, you know, you, you make it into uh, the courtroom. Um, at which point, if you end up with a jury that is not particularly friendly towards trans people, you've now essentially gone to prison or jail for being trans. So let's think about what's happened here so far. So we've um, we've already self-selected for these um, these behaviors that expose us to the enforcement, and now we come in contact with the police, and they've self-selected the ones that they find, um, you know, the most the most criminal, right? So now let's say that I do go ahead and plead not guilty because I believe that I'm truly not guilty, right? Which is also very unlikely because it, typically they they will frighten you into accepting a plea. So you're like, oh, well, we're, we're reducing to a misdemeanor. And you're like, oh, thank you. Right? You still spend six thank you for the misdemeanor. Years. Right, but let's just say you do that and you decide to go to trial. The next layer that you have to get through, in which well, you will disproportionately find yourself um, having a difficult time navigating, is the convenement of the jury. And there's a process called voir dire, which is where the prosecutor and the defending attorneys get to ask each of the jury pool a question. How many people have been on a jury or been called for jury duty and went through that process? We're sitting in the room with all of the people and basically they're profiling or screening the people in the potential jurors um, to determine because both of the, they both have to agree on them. So they can challenge up to a certain number of jurors each. Um, and the prosecuting attorney in particular is going to know that in order to persuade that jury to convict you, they're going to need personalities to whom you're not going to come off particularly sympathetic. So what's going on as they are asking the potential jury members these various questions, if they know that the, um, the accused um, you know, they're, they're already planning their defense. So if they plan to demonize you on these specific um, character traits, then they're going to start asking the jury members these questions. Do you have any family members that are transgender? Things like that, right? Well, yeah, I do. Okay, well, you're off, right? Because what we're trying to do is, we're, what they're trying to do is find 12 people that they believe will convict you, right? And, Right, and or if like they observe that you're actually trans yourself, or you know, <laughs> if you just, you know, they can, they can get you off for any reason. And so, actually, later in this panel, we're going to give you some ideas on how to get through the voir dire process. I was just going to add, having knowledge about this is also going to disqualify you from the panel. Um, jury selectors don't like jury members who know about jury nullification because they don't want it to happen, because it reduces the power of the state in the courtroom. So they call it jury stealthing. You're going to try to get onto the jury without them knowing that you know about jury nullification and you know the power that you as a jury member holds. Um, we all 
I hope we all know that movie uh, Twelve Angry Men. Yeah, yeah. it was a play. It was, it was a movie too. Uh, it was about that one jury member that convinced the rest of the jury to change their guilty plea to not guilty. Um, so you're going to try to be that person. So the next stage, and so at this point, the accused has still been in holding. So like you don't get to witness the selection of your own jury. Um, so you're kind of you're at this point. You're still um, in the your your position in the legal system is what, what Trish described. And meanwhile, over here, they're convening your jury, right? So now it's time for the trial. So you've already been the the jury's already stacked against you. And they bring you in. And now, what is the, the prosecutor's job is to find you guilty. Um, and this is um, where the, the example, and I don't remember her name, I'm sorry, but um, there was a self-defense case in um, one of the eastern cities. Um, and she had actually, um, she was with a couple of her friends, and they had been attacked, and she defended herself with a knife. And they accused her of... Black lesbian gangs. Yeah. Yes. And so they went on TV and they told everybody the black lesbian gangs were roaming the city, and they played on these stereotypes to kind of, um, you know, to like play up the play up those stereotypes. Um, that's the same kind of thing that they're going to do in a courtroom. There was another case in um, Phoenix. Her name was Jessie B. Jessie was a teenage runaway. Um, she was um, living with a bipolar condition or some kind of a depression type thing. Um, and she, her lover was in his like 40s. And they were engaging in the kinds of behaviors that you typically don't engage in unless you have a really um, solid foundation of trust with that person, right? I mean, there are just some things like asphyxi some things like asphyxiation that you don't just do without like training your partner, right? Like that's, <laughs> you don't just go, choke me, I love it, and then next thing you're dead, and like there are safe words for that. Actually, there you can't say a safe word when you're getting choked, so there are, like, there are other ways to like handle that, but you're, you, responsible BDSM is about navigating the conversation about consent, what are your limits, what are we gonna do if something goes wrong, risk or consensual kink. How am I going to signal you? And none of that happened. So the next thing you know, dude's dead, and she's panicking. She flees the scene. Um, well, they went on TV. They called her the teenage goth killer. They completely sens sensationalized it. Um, and she's doing 10 years right now. Because what they did is they brought her into the courtroom, and they played on all of these things. Oh, she has blue hair. She, you know, she's a lesbian. She's look at her Tumblr. And she had, actually, I don't think Tumblr existed at the time, but it, she, been it would have been MySpace, right? MySpace. So she had a MySpace where she had been very open about herself, and, and all of these things were used to smear her character and to play on the um, on the stereotypes of, of the jury members. So in the in the you know in the minds of the jury, if this is the first time they're being um, really hearing that like oh my gosh people like this really exist they, you know um they're going to be more likely to believe the narrative that this person made a, a willful that it, there was a, like an actual murder that took place when what really happened is she was actually um the victim like she he was basically the predatory um essentially a, a pedophile yeah. Yeah. No, I think all right so actually, we ended up talking a lot more than I thought we were going to talk. But um, what we're doing here between Outright and Fija is we're calling for you to take action. Um, educate your friends and family about jury nullification. If they already know about jury nullification, educate them about how it can be used for GSM crimes, crimes, victimless crimes, um, and not just drug, drug war nullification. Um, if you can get onto a jury, stealth. Um, it's really hard to tell you how to stealth because they're going to ask questions specific to the case. You won't always know what they're trying to find out. 
But don't let them know that you know about jury nullification. And they won't ask you about it because they if asking you about it tells you about it. So that's the good thing there. Yeah. So it, try to be sneaky. Um, I'm going to do questions. Just a quick second. Um, so you're going to get them to the jury, um, and then you're going to try to convince your fellow jury members to nullify without telling them that it's called jury nullification. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they make it very difficult for jury nullification to happen because of the power that jury nullification has in combating these victimless crimes. Um, so you got to be sneaky every step of the way. Um, fortunately, now we can take questions. And I saw Max had one, and then we'll, we'll have questions. Oh, I, I was just going to say it's more of a comment, but you guys are welcome. New Hampshire's uh, jury selection is a little bit different. Um, I had a self-defense case, so I learned about the whole process. I thought that we had a voir dire, and I supported it until I saw them using it in civil cases, and now I'm definitely against it. Because um, the lawyers on both sides of the civil cases abuse it. In criminal cases, you can introduce questions, additional questions, that you want the judge to ask. And then the other side can object to that. And that, the prosecutor is always going to object. You submit them in writing before the trial. The prosecutor is always going to object to anything that even implies or hints at any kind of jury nullification or aegis or any mention of, of, of your right to acquit. So you can submit them. You can submit those. Um, but if, it's, if you have an attorney, like a private attorney, private defense attorney, they're now allowed, because we passed this last session, they're now allowed to mention jury nullification to the jury in New Hampshire. However, we tried to get another bill this session. What we really want to get is having the judge notify the jury explicitly that they have the right to acquit in any and all cases. That got shot down in the Senate, unfortunately. Um, but I guess we have a few uh, state senators who don't want to get reelected. But that's another reason for using libertyballot.com. Um, because we actually look at the voting records and you can see who the, the good recommendations are and who the bad ones are. And while that is a goal, um, not every state is set up like that and jury nullification differs by state. So if you get called for jury duty or you're planning a protest or activism event, make sure to look up your own state and locality's laws about it. So you were saying before, I, I think you may have overstated it, that your goal was to convince the entire jury to vote to acquit? I mean, most criminal cases, it has to be unanimous. So even if yeah. you're the sole holdout, does the person still avoid the conviction? And the state has the burden of going through that again or just dropping it if it looks like they can't get a conviction. So I don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to convince 11 other people or six if you have a, a really small jury. I mean, you aim for the moon, aim for right. the stars, and you land at the moon. So uh, try to convince everyone else. Um, even if not, if you hold out, then that's helpful. So just before I, we run out of time, I want to kind of drive something home. Um, because there's another two layers of the harm. And so if you do get um, con convicted by this jury, the next stage is sentencing. So the judge is going to just have heard all of those things. And we don't even get to pick the judge. So you could be before a judge who... Um, has a social conscience and who recognizes that you may have just gotten railroaded and, and goes ahead and, and gives you the, the minimum sentence. Um, but it's just as likely that you're going to be in front of a judge who's going, oh my gosh, what did I just see? Right? And they're going to give you a higher penalty, right? So there's a, and the layers of the disproportionality continue to add up. And then the final step is when you actually get to the prison where you might be housed with the wrong gender. Um, you may be housed with a person who like literally buys and sells you for cigarettes. Like I mean, rape jokes are disgusting, but like in prison, like it actually it happens. Um, so um, you're likely to be murdered and or raped, both by the other in inmates and or by the guards. So the um, the kind of the takeaway from this is that you can save somebody's life, and a sentence for a a, a what's victimless crime can be a death sentence for a gender and sexual minority. It can be a death sentence for anybody, of course. But it happens disproportionately higher to us. Yes. 
Could, um, could, could, question? Uh, could, could there be an occurrence where a jury nullification could actually bring about the wrong result in a case? Um, we did historically see that during the, uh, the civil, civil war and onward up until the civil rights movement. Um, sometimes all white juries would make the uh, vote guilty on cases that were obviously not guilty to uh, defendants who were black or other racial minorities. Um, or like a white guy would kill a black guy. Yeah, or, or let off a white guy who had right, right. done that. Um, but historically, more often than not, and we don't have exact numbers here, all we know is that the general trend is that it tends to nullify victimless crimes and help minorities rather than hurt them. Um, I wish we had numbers, but unfortunately, courts did not keep very documented. Um, Brent and then Daryl. Uh, I guess my question is, it seems like it's equally important to promote people going to jury trial because not a lot of this happened. I mean, like, like you're saying, if you, if yeah, you the, plea bargaining, gone, the plea bargaining thing is really... You know, the one instance where I had to deal with, like, I had like, an expired license and I got pulled over and it was immediately like, oh, plea bargain, let's just deal with it. I was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, and I mean, the thing is, is that plea bargaining in, in a lot of cases is used um, to kind of get around the, the, the possibility of a jury trial. They, the thing is, is that um, in a lot of cases where a person may have been found uh, not guilty, um, and this is, a, I mean, it, it's pretty much in almost any, uh, it doesn't matter, GSM, uh, you know, whatever, generally, um, you know, if a prosecutor's trying to plead you out, uh, chances are that they don't have as much, I mean, they're gonna try and get their conviction in any way they can, but if they start going lower and lower, you know that, like, you've actually got a case there. I have a friend who went to prison, he should have never pled out. Um, he didn't do it. He simply did not do it. it technically, there was no way for him to have done it. Um, but he was, you know, they scared him enough uh, to send him to prison. Um, and that's what they do. And there's actually been, I think, a lot of this being looked at lately, especially in context of uh, drug prohibition. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll start to see that practice being less pushed on people. Um, but it's gonna take some time, but I, I agree. We need to push people to go to a jury trial. <laughs> don't take the plea. Daryl and Angela. Uh, there's actually don't take a plea outreach that happens all across New oh, Hampshire. Yeah. And to so we'd like to see up, more of that. To follow up on the question about uh, instances where jury nullification has happened, during the 1850s, a lot of northern juries would nullify when people were charged with violating the Fugitive Slave Act. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we did mention that in passing real quick, but it did happen frequently, um, very frequently, to the point where a lot of juries just, a lot of courts just stopped trying to prosecute it. Uh, Angela? Two questions. Uh, one, um, in the jury selection process, can now, can lawyers now ask about sexual orientation or gender identification? And two, um, given post 9-11, is outright or some, what is the status currently now of trans people trying to travel in and out, uh, you know, in airplanes where, they're, where their ID doesn't necessarily match their identity? How is that being worked out so they're not being harassed or being felt up or things that are usually happening when, in those situations? Do you know the answer to the first one? The short answer is no. <laughs> but the longer answer is that um, what they would ask is something indirect, but which, like, sort of like what you would go through in a job interview. Like, oh, do you have any, um, I don't know, I can't think of it. Do you have any significant others in your life? And then... If right. So they, they, get, they can ask you questions that tiptoe around it. I'm, I'm going to... I probably I don't think so because it's um it's federal non discrimination, right? So that's I don't think they can bring that into a courtroom, but they can tiptoe around it, right? And well, the other the other lawyer doesn't char doesn't challenge it. Yes. Well, it wouldn't be I mean, if you're just asking like it's not it's not like a you can't ask outright. 
Right, well, I mean, but can you ask anything about jurors? I mean, it's not like they're on trial. Uh, like I would the think jury selection process. No, because they're. Because they could be like, do you attend church service more than once weekly? Like, the voters are all fair in balance. Yeah, but asking about, are you gay? Really, they, they I'm can't. I'm not saying it would be good. I'm just saying, like, uh, <laughs> I think they're restricted from doing that in case it is perceived, um, especially they're trying to avoid giving you any clue of what the case is about. So they're going to tiptoe around it, um, either by law or for their own benefit, they're going to tiptoe around it and ask probing questions instead of direct questions. And then I'm going to let Trish answer the last one. Second. Thank you for that question, by the way, so that we can like get a really succinct answer for next time. So about the TSA checkpoints, um, I personally have never had a problem. Um, but my ID has been changed for years, um, and uh, not to get too specific, but I also don't have a generally standard configuration um, because I'm intersex. Um, so I personally don't, haven't had an issue, but I have known people that have. I know it got better. There was some direction given uh, during the Obama administration uh, regarding this. Um, but whether it is reverted back uh, to how it was before Obama, I'm really not sure. Um, but I know that there's a lot of st like very humiliating searches going on right now uh, regarding the scanners and non-matching parts. So that's really all I can tell you about that. We do see in the media that while they may not have a rule that says your identity has to match up with the marker on your ID, um, they do throw a fuss and will try to attempt to block you from participating in transportation, be it trains or planes or buses. Um, it happens frequently, unfortunately, um, and this is one of the reasons why outright advocates for getting rid of gender markers. Well, so, and one more thing that I remember reading recently, um, it was actually a personal story that um, she had live tweeted what she went through, um, is that when you go through the scanner, they have to push a button for your gender because it scans you differently based on, I, I mean, I don't even know, like... I'm guessing body fat distribution you? No, 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 they can actually... They actually can see what a yeah. I've I've actually seen what the scanners see, um, and they can actually see uh, outlines of body parts, sort of like on a sonogram. Uh, <laughs> so, is that a weapon in your pocket, or are you <laughs> <laughs> basically is is what that is, right? So um, if you're standing there, and in this in the story of this particular person, she wasn't out to her. Um, to her friends. So they were college students, they were leaving to like go fly home, and she's like standing in line realizing this is about to happen, and she's like, how do I tell that agent that I'm actually biologically male without coming out to the people um, that I'm with? And I think in that story, what ended up happening is that like they had went to go put their shoes on, so she got lucky and she was very grateful for that, but the point is that they're humiliating people at checkpoints, and that's not okay. Yeah, I think we've seen a decrease in the number of trans individuals who report choosing flying over other means of transportation because of the TSA, which is unfortunate. Pre-check helps. Pre-check helps, but then you're giving all your information over. Yeah. Uh, didn't Oregon just pass a law that you can decline giving your gender on a driver's license, and would you see that as a positive step? Which state? Oregon. Oregon, yeah, they would definitely be leading the way on that. Um, I believe they just did. But that, that would be wonderful. I'd love to, I'm going to go read more about what exactly that law says mm -hmm. and have, have an opinion eventually. I think what they, so I think. I see two people planning here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Hey man. If it's the, so I, we posted on our page and I just, I'm thinking, was it that they, you could add a, a third, like an other? Or not unreporting the I think it's unreporting is the option. So the thing about that is, is that what we are saying is that we should never have been in the database 
even from birth, right? Because right. what's going on is that they assign you at birth and then they compel you throughout your entire life to conform to that originating right. document. Mm -hmm. So it follows you and creates a, a legal and a financial barrier to self-identification. Right, so you know how we have that concept of unintended consequences. So when the state involves itself in something, not only does it make that thing work worse, but there is like a ripple effect, right? right? So the fact that we have to wonder, what does my ID say and whether I can change it is kind of linked back to that original assignment of the gender. So we, what we're advocating for, well, of course, like abolishing all of the documents, period, but uh, <laughs> barring that, at least no longer even categorizing people by gender. Yeah. And exactly. that right, that right there is a whole nother talk that you're always welcome to hire us for or <laughs> ask us to come talk about. But this is about jury nullification, and we ran through our time. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming and listening. If you have more questions, you can find any of us afterwards. I think we're moving into the open bar and or cash bar, cash bar. The Libertarian State Leadership Alliance presents